Are you there, Bill? Yes, I sure am. I'm here. Okay. I don't know what to do next. Uh, nothing. We're just going to sit tight. Um, a few people are starting to trickle in here. Guys, welcome. Thank you so much for your patience as we work through the tech issues. Come on in. Just sit tight. The email just went out with this new link on Zoom. So I'm going to give people a little bit of time to join us before we actually get started. Okie doke. All right. <laughs> Hello and welcome guys, this is Bill. Sorry for the inconvenience and thank you for being so responsive and jumping on the new link. We're gonna sit tight for just a few more minutes and let some of the others uh, kind of trickle on over as well. Hey Bill, this is Patrick, how are you? Hey good Patrick, how are you doing? I'm glad you found yeah, I got. I was trying to get logged in anyway. Do you want me to put this in the group? I just did. Okay. All right. No worries. Thank you so much. Ah. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I didn't mute everybody, just so you know. So if you are talking, I can't hear you. Uh, thank you so much for your patience and understanding as once again, Murphy's Law has uh, punched us right in the face uh, today with the YouTube Hangouts. That seems to be a pretty uh, common occurrence as we're uh, making things happen. Uh, but I appreciate your adapt adaptiveness. Uh, Carol, you especially. I know uh, it can be very stressful uh, whenever we're uh, talking to a large group of people and the technology doesn't work. So we are going to go ahead and get started. This event, actually, it looks like I'm going to mute some more of you here. All right. So everybody's muted whenever you come on. Uh, Carol and I are going to. Uh, talk about the five key steps to really starting and growing uh, your dream notary business. Uh, as we do that, guys, there is a chat functionality on here. You're free to post questions. And if uh, we see the questions uh, as they're applying to the topic, we'll talk about them. Uh, if not, we're going to kind of review those chat questions at the end and we'll do kind of a Q&A session at the very end for you. Again, welcome if you're just joining us late. Thank you so much for your patience and adaptiveness as we get this thing going. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here in just one second. Good morning, Bill. Hey, good morning. Pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thanks for uh, reading the email and jumping in with us. I really appreciate that. Yes, yeah, there's still a couple of people trying to figure it out, but uh, a lot of them are coming over this way. Excellent. We've got just a couple minutes anyway. I'm just going to prep something on this side, so we're good. All right. Sounds good. Oh, this is so frustrating because we practiced. <laughs> this is, that's kind of the funny <laughs> part, guys. We did so many test calls to make sure this did not happen. <laughs> well, practice makes perfect, you know. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. It was beyond our... Yeah, it was beyond our control. <laughs> this is Terry. I did post a, uh, I typed a message on the other 
site that you had sent an email to watch their email to, to get onto the new site. So I'm not sure how many people saw it, but I did at least do my good deed for the day. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I wonder if I should go on to Facebook in a couple of groups. I don't know if they're on there, Carol. Um, a lot of them, there were a lot of people on the other site waiting for you and Bill to join. And when I saw your email, I had my phone next to me, so I saw your email come across my phone with the urgent. And that's when I typed the message saying, hey, there's technical issues. Go to your email and follow the link to the new site for the webinar. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Yeah. It wouldn't even let us in for that, so I appreciate that. Oh, wow. Yeah, there were a whole bunch of us on there. Yeah, I saw that, and then it wouldn't let us any, let any more in. Okay, so um, I think we've got, we've got about 50 people on the call right now. We'll go ahead and get started just with that. I'm going to go back to muting everybody so we don't get any background noise. And we are going to uh, roll out. So how we'd like to kind of start this, I know we have... Uh, notaries of varying levels you know some of you are not even notaries yet and you're just kind, kind of exploring this some of you are in the beginning stages and some of you are uh, more seasoned agents uh, and you've got some experience under your belt and just looking for ways to increase your revenue so what we'd like to do is Carol and I are just going to kind of share why we're so passionate about this business and why we think it can be a good fit for so many people Carol did you unmute yourself? Okay, good. Would you like to? <laughs> I didn't want to do well like this. <laughs> Not as much value there, yeah. Would you like to start this off and kind of why, um, why you love this business and doing what you do? Sure. Uh, just a little bit about my background. Um, stayed home, raised my kids until my youngest was in high school, went back to my career as an escrow officer, and uh, retired as an escrow manager. I ran two companies jumped into the signing agent business, was a little frightened because I had never been, you know, doing the mobile notary stuff. Um, I loved it. I fell in love with it. And <clears throat> I met a lot of people who tried to do it, but they failed before they ever got the opportunity because the training was just not comprehensive. It just wasn't the detailed handholding that we all need to have. So in 2006, I created my course, Notary to Pro. At that time, I was 66. So you all know I'm 75 now. And we have managed to really do what I intended in the first place, and that's to raise the bar in this industry, which I know Bill is, is doing. <clears throat> and I've got to say this now, just I want to thank Bill so much. I am the worst technology person in the world. <laughs> and he has really put this thing together. Despite what happened, it wasn't yeah, his fault. The team. And I just want him to know that I appreciate what he has done because he really took control here. Um, <clears throat> but I'm very passionate about this business. And I've seen, I've seen a lot of disrespect coming from companies and treating notaries. And I think a big part of it is because there's so many who don't know what the heck they're doing. And they're making mistakes and they're messing up and they're giving everybody a bad reputation. And, and my goal when I first started this was to raise the bar, to give people the opportunity to be entrepreneurs. And, um, and I think that this is really is, is happening now and I'm very excited about it. And when I reached out to Bill, <clears throat> I saw some of the stuff he was doing online and I got that same feeling from him that he and I really, really love the people that we work with and our intentions are really to, to, to just higher the level, um, the, the playing field, so to speak. So that's, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And I think we have a lot in common that way for sure. You know, um, so for me specifically about the, the job as a mobile notary and loan signing agent, what appealed to me was, you know, I kind of consider myself unemployable. You know, I'm a free spirit. I like to do my own thing. I like to get rewarded for the work that I do. Uh, I like to get creative with ideas and then be able to implement them right away without, you know, red tape and bureaucracy of going through employers. I don't want to be told what to do. You know, I don't like that. Nobody's the boss of me. So I've always had that kind of entrepreneur spirit. But as in my experience, 
you know, I went through a lot of different businesses and a lot of them just kind of flopped or didn't make it until I got to this notary business. When I applied all that business knowledge just to this being a mobile notary and loan signing agent, which I never had even occurred to me until a friend told me about it, everything changed for me. You know, and I talk about it a lot. It's kind of my mantra in my business. You know, it's flexible, it's unlimited, it's legit. And be, having a business that I could be proud of, that was legitimate, and I didn't have to go sell stuff that people didn't want, and I didn't have to recruit a team in order to make $100,000 a year, uh, meant something to me. You know, I can be proud of this. I'm sanctioned by the state. I serve the people of my state. I help prevent fraud. You know, that's stuff that I can really take with me and, and talk about and get excited about. And then the income level blew my mind. You know, I never knew that this job even existed. And here I am living really a dream life, making more money than I've ever made before. Uh, and I have to pinch myself every day. It's truly unlimited and it's old fashioned. You know, it's not just go out and do the work and get paid. And there's something that I really, that, that really appeals to me. You know, it's not, it doesn't have to be the get the next big thing, the get rich quick. It's a good old fashioned, just hard work business. And you can apply new technologies to it and really have fun with it. And then of course the flexibility is huge for me. I love to travel, I love to hang out with my friends and family. So uh, this particular role really helps with that. So that's why I love this business. Plus the people I get to meet uh, really just change everything. Not even in the course. I love the students that are part of the course, but every day, you know, I'm, I'm still a hustling signing agent. So I'm out on the road pretty much all day. And I get to meet these amazing families that are buying a new home, their first home, they're retiring, they're just moving here. So I get a little bit of everything that I need, you know, a little social interaction, lots of alone time in the car, a lot of time to read books or listen to books. Uh, it's, so it's a perfect and diverse mix uh, for what I'm looking for in my life. And I think it is for a lot of people as well. And there's so much opportunity. And that's really what I kind of want to bring into right now. And we'll get into the actual training here is there's a, so much opportunity in this business right now. Not only do we have the loan signing side, so that includes like refinances, new home purchases, um, new construction purchases, but also you have the uh, general notary work, which is really booming right now. There's a huge lobby across the country to increase the state um, minimum fee or maximum fees for notary work. And that could, now can range where it used to be, you know, $2 or $5. We're seeing a lot more states where you can charge five, 10, 15, and even $20 per notary stamp. So you're seeing a lot more notaries, especially on the West coast where these fees are 15 or $20 able to make a substantial income, never having to even sign a loan document package. You know, they're just doing general notary work, last wills and testaments, powers of attorney, uh, titles on vehicles, those types of things. So there's literally uh, so much that you can do with this business and there's little add on services and extra businesses that work within this business. So there's so much that you can do on that note, we're going to jump in let me just kind of give you an overview of what this looks like here. Uh, I went ahead, I have to talk with my hands. I'm sure you've noticed in some of my videos. So I put myself in front of a marker board so I can talk and write. But to get us started, um, we've got the five key steps here. So just to lay it out for you, you know, obviously the first step, you have to become a notary public. You have to get certified as a, so a signing agent. And I say have to, and there's some flexibility there, but we'll get into that. Three, you got to learn how to do the work. Four, you got to get customers. And might want to learn how to be amazing too. Uh, growing your business and growing yourself at the same time and actually in tandem is where you're going to see the most success. And number five is the tools and tricks that you need to, that you can use to help manage your business. So we're going to dive right into that. Uh, step one is uh, how to research and become a notary public in your state. Carol, would you like to kind of lead the way on that one? Sure. There are several ways that you can do this. Um, I have a suggestion, and I know that, uh, that Bill does as well, but basically it starts with the Secretary of State for your state. Uh, you can go directly to them. You can Google. They'll give you information how to get in touch with them. They'll give you information about some of the requirements for your particular state. Do they have any training at all? Very few states do. 
Um, mostly, it's just a matter of put your money down and take your uh, your test if there was a uh, an exam, uh, or just pay your money and get get your um, background check done and everything through the state. You cannot have a felony on your record. That's the the first thought that you need to know. Uh, if you've had a felony, uh, you will not be allowed to be uh, a notary public, which is a public servant. If you have, and I do have students who come and they say, oh, I had a DUI, or I had some kind of a misdemeanor, or I was, con I was not convicted, but I was uh, accused of a certain crime or something like that, but I wasn't convicted, then you should be okay. But you want to keep that in mind before you go through that process. Um, there's other ways to obtain your license. And one of the things that I suggest to a lot of people who come to me is to go through an association. Um, I happen to like the American Association of Notaries. Uh, they started as a Texas group, and now the owner has gone nationwide. He's been nationwide for a long time. They offer really helpful advice, very nice people, very knowledgeable, and they work quickly. They have packages that you can go to get your, your notary uh, commission through them. And in those packages, you can always get, also get your notary journal. You can get your stamp. Uh, and all of those things uh, in one package are very, very reasonable. So that's one way to do it. Um, and Bill, why don't you tell us about the, uh, the American Society of Notaries? Because I'm not familiar with them. Sure, no problem. I'm going to hit mute on everybody because some, some people have uh, slipped through. So if you'll just unmute yourself again. Uh, so, uh, the American Society of Notaries, again, I'm not affiliated with them. I don't know a whole lot about them. What I love about their site, though, is it's very information-based. So, you can, they actually have like a map of the United States, and you can just go and click on your um, state and get the information you need uh, without being oversold on things. So, speaking of oversold on things, that rolls us right into the National Notary Association. The NNA uh, is amazing in, very, in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the biggest complaints that I hear back from them though is that every time you call in for help, they're trying to sell you something. And a lot of times, it's not what you need to uh, start or grow your business. So while they're a great resource and they do have similar bundled packages, um, I hesitate to make that your first stop because I talk to a lot of notaries just starting out when you know the budget's super tight, they're being sold things that are not going to make a difference in their business this early on. So uh, use them for the great that they do. Just be aware that you don't always have to uh, buy everything that they pitch to you, including a membership. Uh, they have a lot of services available for free. And if you have any questions on that, this is where being a part of a community can really be helpful. You know, you've got always, Carol and I are a great resource. Uh, the, but the fellow students that are in the two classes or the Facebook forums, uh, you can definitely um, find out what you truly need in there. Just be, again, pretty aware that when you go to a, a forum group, you're going to have, for as many people that are in there, you're going to have that many different opinions about how things should be done. So you have to kind of sometimes take it with a grain of salt. Make sure that your mentors uh, are experienced and have the results that you want before you put too much credence into it. Okay, that kind of brings us okay, to... You want me to cover the, uh, a few of the other things then? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you have to get uh, in every state that I'm aware of is you need to have a bond. Usually they only require uh, like a $10,000 bond, some less, some more. And that's obtained. They'll, they can give you information about where to obtain it, but usually it's through some sort of an insurance company or agent. And that is something that's required. They, as I mentioned, may have training through the state. Uh, they may offer training, which is, is great because that gives you a basis for at least doing notary work, um, not talking about loan signing agents. And by the way, the Secretary of States all over the country, I don't think that there's one that recognizes loan signing agents. So if you have a problem or a question as a loan signing agent, they're not going to help you. Yeah. They only recognize notaries public. That's what they're in charge of. So any diversion of that, any kind of specialty that you do, 
they don't they don't want to talk about it they don't want to give you information and they don't want to help you just so you'll know uh, one of the things that you have to do and is a part of it and you need to know this because I have had students that have indicated to me that they got some paperwork in the mail they thought it was their commission and what they didn't realize is that it's a piece of paper that they have to take down to the office or to a court clerk and you have to take an oath of office and that has to be done before you actually get your commission okay once you get your commission you have to also be aware of the fact that if you're ordering a stamp you in every place that I'm aware of you must provide a copy of your stamp of your commission in order for you to get a stamp which is a safety precaution otherwise anybody could go in and order a notary stamp okay um, so I think I think that's about it we've talked about the, the different resources about where to get your commission and how to do it but if you're really nervous about this and new I strongly suggest that you go through a company that doesn't charge you very much money to package it for you. It's very simple. And like the American Society of Notaries, if you go to the AAN, American Association of Notaries, it's you just get there and there's a big map and you click on your state and it'll carry you through the rest of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great service. And it just kind of consolidates the information for you. Because the uh, anytime you're working with the government, I'm sure you've experienced it, it's not always super clear, like step one, step two, step three. They've got all their legalities in there, so sometimes it can be uh, a little convoluted when you're going through the Secretary of State's website. And also, just a, a point, uh, the Secretary of State doesn't always regulate notaries. In some states, there are actually other entities that handle that. So just be aware, if, you go, if you're go, if you looking at the Secretary of State and you don't find it, just it somewhere else. And a quick Google search can get you the information that you need. I think that pretty much kind of covers what we're going to talk about. Oh, one thing that we're going to do, guys, is the resources that the stuff that we're talking about here. Uh, we're going to send that out to you in an email uh, shortly after this call. So you're actually going to get uh, some of the samples that we're going to show a little later on. Uh, plus, uh, Carol created a document that shows the difference between uh, what a, a bond is, your notary bond, and who that protects versus what we're going to talk about next, which is, which is errors and omissions insurance and who that protects. So that will come out to you as well. So would you like to just jump right into step two on the... Uh, sure, side? but I have to tell you, we have some strong competition in here. Oh, two yeah. of the cutest little faces. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're getting a to see them? Um, and... and uh, <laughs> Jenny, I think, is, is waving. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, first of all, NNA certification. I have had a big problem with this for years because I felt that there was kind of a monopoly going on. Um, their certification is very important, and I have learned to live with it. A lot of companies, especially some, a couple of the larger title companies, such as First American Title, Fidelity, who also have a lot of subsidiaries that you might want to work for, they do require the National Notary Association uh, certificate. However, there, we, I've actually been communicating with the NNA over the years, and they are now offering something which I find um, very, very helpful, very good. If you choose not to take their signing agent course, which is, um, I think it's, it's a little under $200, there is another way around it that you need to be aware of. You can order your background screening, and a lot of companies require the NNA background screening. You can order your background screening from the NNA. It, the cost of it is $65. Uh, there are other alternatives. I know on my website, on our graduates' website, we have a company that does it for $40. So if you're concerned less about the um, MNA background, you can go through CrimCheck, which is also accepted for less money. However, the $65, if you'd like to be certified by the NNA, is well worth it because what they do is they get they give you your background screening and your clearance, and then uh, they offer you the um, opportunity to take an exam. Now, this exam is not based on notary work. It is based on something called uh, SPW Code of Conduct. 
This was a group that was formed at the end of 2013. It's called the, uh, the Signing Professionals Workshop, SPW. This was a group of companies, title companies and lenders that got together and said, basically, uh, this doesn't sound kind, but basically, we want to tell notaries what we want them to do. We're going to kind of take charge here. And the NNA was instrumental in helping them form their group because I won't get into it. But anyway, they did that. They, uh, they do base this test on that code of conduct. And uh, there is a lot of study material out there. Uh, so it's not difficult to pass if you read that study material. Once you pass that, then you get your uh, National Notary Association certification. So now you've got your certification, which is acceptable by all companies. And, uh, and then you have the background screening as well. Um, the, uh, let's see, oh, E&O insurance. Okay, I'm going to talk about that. Their uh, E&O insurance is called errors and omissions insurance. And this is to protect you against mistakes that you made, not intentional things, but just mistakes of something in the venue that may have caused people a problem. Um, so when you go to order it when you're new, I always suggest to my students that they start off with $25,000. Most of my students don't have a lot of money and they need to kind of cut corners and be wise about how they spend their money. I do let everyone know that if they have the opportunity to um, go to work for title companies, um, and we have a few title companies on our, our list that we give to people. Um, once you get in with a title company, you should be in, in the process of immediately upping your E&O insurance to 100,000. All title companies across the states require 100,000 in E&O insurance. And you can even get that for one year. You don't have to get it for the four year period. So if your concern is financial, there's ways around that. Um, and I do, like Bill said, I do have a, a paper that's gonna be sent to you that is a very clear definition of the difference between E&O insurance and your bond. Um, I suggest that there's a couple places that you can go to get your E&O insurance. One of the, the most, um, I think the easiest to work with and the least expensive is uh, Notary Rotary. And this is a good place to, to be to be a member. They, have, they offer a lot of discounts if you're a premium member on supplies, notary supplies. This is also a place where you can list yourself uh, by your zip code so that people are looking for you. They can find you by zip code. Also, this is a place where they have a list of signing services and it's comments by notaries all over the country about these signing services. Um, as I said, we have a list and all of our, all of the people on our list we've had for years, they are all four and five star rated. And what that means is that they're not going to not pay you. It means that they respect you and they're going to pay you. But if you go in there and to check and you see that there's a one star, two star, even a three star, be very careful, read the comments about them because it's very possible that if you take a signing, you will not get paid. There's just companies out there that, that don't pay you. Um, and later on, sometime at a, at, a, at a later date, I want to talk about what to do if you do take a, a signing from a company that does that. All insurance companies, well, I don't know, Bill, you work with, you've worked with what, travelers, and, yeah. and there's in some independents that can go ahead and issue that. Yeah, there are. So Travelers Insurance, State Farm Farmers, they all have sometimes uh, the ability to issue E&O insurance as well. So if you have a favorite broker, you can go there. Uh, the NNA is also another resource. The NNA is notoriously slow on issuing those policies. In fact, I just got mine via snail mail, which was kind of a surprise to me. I bought it a week ago and I, they mailed it to me. Uh, so there's a little, they do things a little different, but there's definitely some resources. And we have somebody here on the forum right now, TFG, uh, TWFG, who just said he's an insurance agent. And if, if anybody has questions, they can ask him. Cool. Um, and then I'd like, like to talk a little bit, too, about uh, my take on the signing agent exam, too, guys, because 
you know, there's a reason that I put it number two, which seems kind of backwards for some people, because some people think we should go and get training before we would take a, a certification exam. And that makes logical sense. Unfortunately, sometimes in this business, logic doesn't always prevail. That's kind of my opinion on this test. It literally is about a code of conduct that does kind of apply to your, your business, but it's not going to have any bearing on your ability to do this job well. Uh, so all you have to do is pass a multiple, multiple choice test in an 80% or better. That's why I think um, both Carol and I, inside our courses, we take steps to just help get you through that. Because once you have that certificate in your hand, you can literally start making money. And you won't necessarily want to just jump in and start taking signings without training. But at least you get that part out of the way and you can move right into step three, which is where you learn how to do this work. Do you want to take us away on step three? Um, yeah, but I, you got to be careful because I have a lot to say. Yeah, about this. you're right. Okay, well, here, let me, okay. I'll, I'll start this off. Okay. On this. Um, okay, so we're done here on step two. So step three, or step He's three. He's used to doing these webinars and I'm not. <laughs> That's okay, we'll get you there. So on, um, <laughs> for step three, we're talking about the kind of the practical matters. So how do you do this job and do it in a way that uh, enhances the customer experience, uh, gives you a little bit of peace of mind, and then also allows you to maximize your revenue. So this is where we're going to talk about the documents. We're going to talk about etiquette and processes to keep things smooth and efficient. Now, this is obviously a huge section to talk about. So again, this training, you know, trying to cram all of this into an hour or so is uh, virtually impossible. So we're just going to touch on a few of the topics. And then uh, Carol and I have already talked about uh, coming together and doing way deeper, more specific training uh, as we go through it as well. So we'll just kind of give you a glance over on this. So one of the most important things that you want to do is kind of shift your mindset and realize the importance of the role that you have. Uh, and when you respect the role that you have, it, it shows. You have confidence. You, you take, uh, as Carol says, gentle control of assigning. You know exactly what you're doing. And it gets conveyed to the borrowers, it gets conveyed to your clients, and things just roll smooth and efficient. Where you see a lot of challenges is some signing agents uh, get very lackadaisical about their role. They forget that this is a critical role in preventing a fraud. You know, they forget that this, uh, having a terrible signing agent can lead to a terrible uh, home buying experience or refinance experience. Your role does make a difference own that and respect that and then all the, the rest of the pieces actually kind of fall into place that way. Would you agree on that Carol? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I emphasize, I, I always, when my students get their first signing, they have to call me as soon as they get it. First of all, they're so excited they can't believe it and then I tell them, that it's so true, they come out of the course, they're confident, they're excited, they can't wait to get started. And then they get their first signing and all the blood in their brain winds up around their ankles. <laughs> yeah. And it's true. It's absolutely true. And you know that that's exactly what happens. But one of the things that if they're well versed, if they know what they're doing and that you write, if they're confident and there's confidence shows in a lot of little ways. And you and I have talked about that um, going into the, the home prepared to, not only go through documents, but to show some interest in who they are. And, you know, just look around. If the lady makes Afghans, you know, say something nice about it. But then you have to be in control as far as uh, when they lead you to the table. You want to know how in advance you're going to be pa passing those documents around. Where are people going to sit? When you do that little thing, it, it shows people, oh, that person's done this before they immediately have more confidence in you. So they're not going to be questioning. They're not going to be, you know, kind of intimidated by you. Another thing that is so important, enjoy what you're doing. These are so fun. Most of the people out there, tell you what, my husband and I worked in Arizona for seven years. We did thousands of signings. And out of all of those signings, there was five 
that we wouldn't want to do again. Other than that, people are just so nice. And one of the things I do tell my students, the moment you walk in that door, be yourself. Be confident in what you know, and it'll just all come and you'll enjoy it. And, and there's so many nice people out there. And to know that you're doing your best and that when you leave that, and people always ask me, I have a video on YouTube that's been viewed like 78,000 times or something. And people will um, say, that's wrong. You can't do that. You can't go through those documents and show what they are. And I'm like, there's a difference between being a notary public and a trained professional notary signing agent. The big difference. When you're a professional notary signing agent, you have the knowledge and the ability to go through documents and show them. And I've, it took me years to come up with this the what and the where, but not the how and the why. And if you'll just do that, it, it'll all fall into place. Just be yourself and enjoy the process. Yeah, um, we'll, we're gonna get in there and uh, show you kind of an example of, of the document as well here in just one second too. And I just wanna touch on what Carol just talked about because you're gonna see this thing from now on and it's actually started in this business and any business in life in general. This is the most relationship-based business I have ever been a part of, and I've been a part of a lot of them. Who you know and the connections you make make everything happen in this business. You are always one relationship away from changing your entire life and your business. One connection can do everything. So what you want to do is you want to connect authentically. And even on the signing side, you know, when you're sitting with a, a new home buyer or somebody who's refinancing, you never know who's across the table from you. You never know how that's going to impact you. I got a hundred thousand dollar a year client once because she was refinancing her house and happened to be the manager of a title company. And we just hit it off because I did. I showed up. I was myself. I was authentic. I like to have fun on these things. So I dropped my nerdy notary jokes and we just have fun with it. And that result, that happens all the time and it can happen for you. So what Carol's saying is showing up authentically and being yourself makes all the difference. And then finding a way to stay connected throughout the years uh, it, with either the signing clients or your uh, uh, escrow clients, whatever it is, really makes a difference. And we're going to get into that as we go down too. What, um, the second part of what we were going to talk about is integrity and how important that is. Uh, you're gonna integrity means a lot of different things to different people. Uh, it's a very internal decision uh, in most cases, and then in other cases, like um, when you're a notary public, you have to have integrity, knowing what it is that you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. That's your responsibility, and you've agreed to those terms whenever you become a notary public. So you have to stay in integrity with that. And then another huge factor in it of integrity that a lot of people don't realize is showing up on time is integrity so if you are if you're late you are out of integrity and there's always room for uh, for negotiation on things but you all as a professional you always want to be on time whether it's for a phone call a meeting a signing uh, an interview whatever it is stay in integrity and the reason that i really drive integrity home so much is that there is there's a lot of different opinions and a lot of different teachings and trainings that are out there available to you and some of them actually teach um, the opposite of integrity they they teach you to step outside of integrity to go against your gut to go against what's right and i urge you to always trust your sense of what's right and wrong and never do anything that pushes you outside of that if it doesn't feel right if it feels sleazy it probably is and you shouldn't do it you can make a lot of money in this business and you can connect to a lot of people being honest and being integrity. In fact, those are relationships that are going to last a lifetime, not just a transaction. And that's what we're going for here. You're not looking for a transaction. Oh, thanks for the 150 bucks. You're going for a lifetime of connection, joy. And then of course the revenue is there too, you know, but always have the big picture in mind. Do I want $150 or do I want $150,000? Those are what you can do whenever you show up with integrity and authenticity. Do you have uh, yeah. Can I interject something about being on time? Because yeah. this, th this is what I impart to my students. 
when you have people who are doing probably the most important financial uh, thing of their life, uh, they're, they're waiting for you. They know that this woman or this man is coming at 6 o'clock. They start watching that clock at 6 o'clock, and they start getting really nervous by five minutes after. So I, I tell my students, even if you're going to be 10 minutes late, you need to call and let these people know that there's been a problem and you're apologizing and you will be there because people can get very freaky when, when you're yeah. not there when you say you're supposed to be. Here's the thing about this business, and this is what I've learned in my experience. You know when you're going to be late. There's either traffic feels weird, you know, where everything's backed up, or clients are just reading every document, or one client was late, so everybody's late. You know, I know usually several hours in advance. And even if I'm not late, I tell people I'm going to be. And I give them three or four hours notice. Look, hey, uh, one of my clients was late. It's kind of bumped my schedule. Do you have flexibility to go at 5.30 instead of 5 p.m.? Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And then I might still show up on time. But I've given them so much time that they can plan their life. It's the signing agents that at 5.58, they text for 5.58 p.m. for 6 p.m. signing, and then they text or call and say they're going to be 30 minutes late. That, those are the ones that piss people off. Because they, they're, just like Carol said, they're sitting, they're waiting, they've, they're holding off on eating dinner until you leave. So, you know, who knows what's going on? So the more notice you can give, the better. And that's huge, guys. And what, the reason that's so huge, and you, I'm sure Carol has tons of stories. I have, like, this arsenal of stories about uh, terror exp uh, experiences with notaries that don't show up or show up in pajamas. You know, I've got all of those, too. The cool thing is that gives opportunity for people like you and me to step up and really bring the joy to this entire program. Uh, to our clients, they are there's so much room for us to shine and really raise the standard. Like Carol said in the very beginning, we can raise the bar in this entire industry just by doing normal stuff like showing up on time and dressing well and those kinds of things. Okay, so. Let's, uh, I know we kind of went off on a, on a tangent on that one. Um, shall we do this example document? Sure. Okay. Which one are you going to do? I'm going to do the note. You want to do the note or what are you going to do? I'm going to do the note. Oh, okay. Yeah, the deed of trust was going to be too long and I know we have a little bit of a time crunch now, especially with our technical problems. So guys, um, what I'm going to share with you is the script that I use on virtually every single note that I do in the signing. And what this is, is it's literally a script and I use it on every signing and I have one of these for almost every single document that could be in a loan document package. The reason I created this was in the first few years of my business, I used to get knots in my stomach before every signing. I was so nervous. I didn't know what I was going to see. I didn't know how to explain things. So it was just like I was reinventing the wheel after every single signing. So that was a miserable life for me. So I came up with a script that is designed to address questions before they're asked and uh, just allow for smooth and efficient transitions. And it actually has worked out really well. So I'm going to share my screen here. And what you're seeing is just a traditional note. And this is a, it's actually for a VA loan, but it, it does not matter. So I'm going to set this document in front of the borrower, and I'm going to start like this. So with this next document, this entire stack of paper in front of you basically supports these four pages. This is called your, prom your note. It's your promise to pay the loan back. So it has all the terms of your loan, so it's very similar to the closing disclosure that we went over earlier. You're going to see your loan amount, your fixed interest rate, your first payment is not due until December 1st. You do have a right to prepay the loan at any time with no prepayment penalties. And every month they give you a 15 day grace period. And then after that on day 16, they're gonna charge you 4% of your principal and interest only payment. And then of course, if you just stop making payments altogether, there is some ramifications for that. I could just get your signature right here on page four. Boom, and that's it guys. Can I add something, Bill? Absolutely. Very important, and I think you and I talked about it. One of the things as you're going through these documents, sorry folks, it doesn't stop ringing, but 
my assistant will pick it up. Um, one of the things that's extremely important as you're going through these documents is that you don't sit and read them, and, and Bill does not do that, I know, but you want to make sure that your their eyeballs are actually looking at it. You're holding that note so that they can see it. You can use a pointer, whether it be your finger or a pencil or something. It's extremely important that they are reading it and looking at it while you're showing it to them because there is a possibility that if you're reading it to them, that somebody is going to at some day call the lender when they get the final paperwork and their bill, uh, and they're going to say, the notary told me that my interest rate was at 3.65 and it's at 4.65 as the notary. So it's very important that you make sure that they're looking at it, that they read it, that they hear it. Yeah, and the, so the, the, the real talent that uh, comes from this is that we have to walk a, a very fine line between explaining and briefly describing. So we do not, we're not licensed financial professionals, so we cannot explain their loan, how it works. All we can do, like Carol said, we can explain the what and the where, but we can't explain the how or the why. We can't get into that because that has too many variables. Our job is just to show them where to find the information on the document and make sure that everything gets signed, dated, and initialed correctly. Carol, you want to talk a little bit about the etiquette part on the dress? Yeah, the, well, okay. Here's my take on it, and this is how I teach. Uh, I know that there are companies that will say you have to meet a certain uh, code. Men have to be in suit and ties, women in the high heels and dresses. I've seen that on instructions. And quite frankly, I never did see myself uh, or anyone else uh, going to a cattle farm in the middle of Texas with their high heels on. I think that you need to dress appropriately and I believe and I think you do too in business casual your grooming is everything it, you've got to be clean you've got to be uh, well dressed in that you're not going to be wearing holy blue jeans or tank tops uh, I would not suggest to anybody that they go with piercings no flip-flops you want to be dressed you know nice comfortable business casual clothing um, uh, things like, and we've talked about this, things like parking your car. Don't pull into their driveway. You don't know who else might be looking to park there. Uh, or if you're blocking the garage and somebody else, keeping somebody else uh, from, from leaving, going to work or whatever. So you want to find an appropriate place to park where you're out of the way. Um, etiquette includes, I think, even the, to going so far as to not putting on a lot, a lot of... Uh, uh, what is the cologne that the men may put on uh, or perfume for a woman? You don't know what kind of sensitivities they have. They could be allergic to it. So, I mean, it's all kinds of things. It's, it's, it's the way that you handle yourself uh, when you're there. Um, you know, don't, you certainly wouldn't wander around the house by yourself. If you did, if you needed to use the restroom, which you really should not do, but if you absolutely have to, you need to be, a, you know, polite and uh, I mean, I don't know, there's just so many things that go into the etiquette field, but there really those is. are the things I talk about. Yeah, so there is uh, there is so much that a, lo a lot of times you, it's, you don't think about it because it just seems, some, for some it's common sense to do it, for others it's kind of, it just seems like it, they could do it. But just so you know guys, in, in all my years of experience, I've never used a customer's restroom. You know, I'll wait for a Starbucks, I'll hit a gas station or whatever it is. I don't, I do not ask. Very, people get very uncomfortable with that because they're, a lot of times they're moving, things are a mess, they get so insecure about it. And then the other thing is food and beverage, guys. There's um, a couple of different reasons why uh, you would not accept food and beverage from a customer. Um, number one, you never know uh, what's in it. So there's a safety issue there. Um, and then also, a lot of people do it because it's polite to offer it. But you should be prepared on your own without it. Now, there's some exceptions, like Carol brought up, and I know for sure uh, in like hot areas, you've got to stay hydrated. And if you're out of water and you need water, get some water. But also take personal responsibility for yourself. 
have an ice chest full of water, you know, stop at a gas station ahead of time, hydrate yourself if you have time. There's going to always be exceptions, but as a general rule of thumb, we're not eating, we're not drinking. Plus, oh yeah, Carol, the, the mess issue, right? <laughs> you have open containers on the table and you spill it. Uh, both Carol and I have nightmare stories about actually doing that. And I actually have a video on YouTube about the, the day I did that and spilled coffee all over an entire set of documents. It creates, it's a, it's a total nightmare. It's a big A&W nightmare. root beer. Or you got root beer, yeah. So <laughs> keep those things in mind as, as you're going through it. Now let's talk a little bit about industry norms. I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit here because we're coming up to the one hour mark and I want to make sure we get to some of these great questions that people are asking. So one of the uh, things that you can just expect as a loan signing agent working for signing companies especially is late documents. That's where the uh, signing company or the uh, escrow company sends you the documents like super late. You know, you got a two o'clock appointment, it's noon, you still don't have documents and you have an hour drive. That sometimes happens um, pretty on the regular sometimes. So you got to be prepared for that. Did you have anything you wanted to talk about specifically on the late documents, Carol? Um, just that they're the most frustrating thing. It's just unbelievable how casual the lenders and some of the title companies take these, uh, that situation. We prepare, we do everything we're supposed to do. We make the appointment. We want to be there on time. And you've got, the, maybe you've taken the appointment two days ago. They've had plenty of time. And now you are with a five o'clock appointment and it's three o'clock and you don't have any documents. It's so frustrating. And everybody, I know all of my students, they call me when this happens. They're just beside themselves, but it's happening more and more. It's very frustrating. So here's what I suggest that people do. Once you get started and you start working with the same companies over and over again, you're gonna get a real good feel for what lenders and what, what companies are not going to be giving you the documents on time. So as you're setting the appointment, when you're confirming the appointments, I actually get to the point where I would say there is a possibility that the documents will be late uh, and I will let you know, but are you available a little bit later if we have to, to extend this, this time a little bit? And that seems to be working for my students really well. It takes that fear and that terrible frustration of out, you know, of letting people down and not showing up because you don't have documents. But yeah, it's, it happens all the time now. Very bad. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really great idea. That's really being proactive and taking control of that. And it, it'll blow your mind how cool people are. You know, when you communicate with them ahead of time, they are totally flexible. And if they're not, they'll tell you and you can make some stuff happen. So let's talk a little bit about incorrect documents too, because it kind of ties into this. Very oftentimes, uh, well, I wouldn't say very oftentimes, but every now and then you get documents that are incorrect. I'm going to hit mute again, guys. Sorry, we got some background here. It can be. Are people able? Carol, I just muted you. Sorry, you have to unmute yourself. Our people, we've not used this platform. We were going to do something else and it didn't work. Um, are people, people able to decide whether they want us to see them or not? Yes, they can make that. Because easy. we see some of you. Yep, they, they can turn their camera on or off. And I've, I've seen some comments in here. We got some people who are dressed in pajamas and who knows what else. So if, you're not, if your camera's not on, that's totally okay. Uh, and then some of you are. Thank you. I love seeing your faces as well. So I will get my jammies on. <laughs> I'm right behind you. So the, um, the to, <laughs> now and then you're going to get uh, incorrect documents, guys. And who knows what the corrections are? It's usually address problems or name problems. When you have uh, errors like that or mistakes on the documents, there's not a, you don't have um, the power to determine what to do on that. Uh, that needs to go to the closing agent and they will uh, go up the chain and figure out how to fix it. Luckily, sometimes making corrections right at the signing is a possibility. And the way you make corrections on the, on the document, you'll just follow the lender's instructions, but it's usually you just strike it out with one, or you'll have the signer strike it out with one single line, write in the correction, and then initial it. So 
minor mistakes can be fixed right at the table. Occasionally, it will require a full redraw of the documents. And if that's the case, that's a whole other ball of wax. It is a pain. Uh, you probably have to go back and pick up documents somewhere wherever you're doing your printing and then come back. So in a perfect world, that would be a double signing and you should be compensated twice. Uh, for escrow companies, one thing that I teach, I really advocate for going for signing companies because when you do, they, there's a whole other level of respect, guys. When you work with escrow officers, they, they value your service. They treat you respectfully. It's business to business. Uh, if you have to go out twice or if you have to print twice or it's a long trip, you know, they compensate you with, without question usually. When you work with signing companies, that's where things get kind of muddled a little bit and you, uh, the, you know, they won't want to pay you a full fee for showing up to do your job. They'll maybe only charge you 20 or pay you $25 for the first trip and things like that. That's just part of the game, unfortunately, we play with signing companies. And that's why I'm such a huge advocate for working with Escrow Direct. And we're going to get into that a little bit in phase four here in a second. Now, uh, the other thing that you're going to run into very oftentimes is identification issues where the name on the ID does not match the name on the documents, or there might be other errors like having a junior or not having a junior, being the third, having more middle names or last names than what's shown on the documents. Those are pretty common errors too. And each one is kind of handled case by case. And we'll dive into the uh, ID training. I think, Carol, that would probably be a really good one for you and I to go really dive deep into because there's so many different ways uh, that could go. Okay, well, here's kind of a, a, a simple rule as far as, because a lot of times on the documents, you'll have someone who has their first name, their middle initial, their last name. Is this what you want me to talk about specifically? Sure. Um, Bill, is the, the things that we run into most commonly? We can just okay. do a quick example. So you have someone who has a first name, middle initial, last name on the documents. And you're looking at their identification, and they have their first name, their entire middle name, and their last name. If it's more on the identification than it is on the documents, but it all kind of matches the first name, middle initial, last name, then you're fine. You don't have to worry about it. Now, here's one of my pet peeves, uh, and I'm just going to impart this. This might be a little bit too much, but I want to say it because it's really important. Uh, for years, when we would have a signing, go to the, the people's homes, and we would have them sign the way they normally would sign. You'd check their ID, you'd see that maybe it was a scribble, and but so you'd have them use that signature because that's their legal signature. So many companies would come back, back in those days, and they would say, we can't use this, they have to sign the name so that we can read it. And there was a bunch of us that were pretty proactive in this, in this business, and we determined that no, you are not going to make this signer sign with the name which is opposite to the way that their legal signature is. And that's what we would say, I am not making this person forge their own signature. I don't know if you've run into this, I'm sure you have, Bill, right? Signatures that are Ill illegible. So yeah. that's, the, that's what I do, uh, and I've never had anybody since then in the last few years ever say, no, we, we won't accept that signature. You tell them that you're asking them to forge their signature if they don't put their legal signature and they leave you alone now. That's an interesting spin on it for sure. So um, my general rule of thumb is I love illegible signatures because there's no way to question the signature. It's when you have legible signatures that do not match, that's where you're gonna run into the problem. So like if you have a lady whose name is Sherry Marie Smith. And that's how they have her name typed on the document. But she signs Sherry Smith. And you can read it as Sherry Smith where it's clearly missing the Marie. That's where lenders push back. Yeah. Nope, no, true. absolutely. No. I'm talking about scribbled signatures. Yep, no, no, no. Two dots and a line. Well, that, those are a dream for me. 
because a lender can't argue with those. They can't argue with it. As long as it matches the ID. So that's the other problem that you run into, guys. And this is one of the things, this is where adaptability in this industry really will serve you because there is no umbrella statements. We can't just say, yes, the signature like this works all the time. It doesn't work that way. Almost nothing in this industry does. So you have to be adaptable. You can't get so frustrated and upset with it. Otherwise, you'll just drive yourself crazy all day long. It's okay to ask. If you see something like this and the signature, maybe Sherry's signature, and you do see these a lot, like that. And I always ask them if that constitutes their full signature, their full name. Exactly. And if as they, it is on the identification. Yep. If their ID says this, and that represents Sherry Marie Smith, then you're usually golden. Now, there are some lenders out there. You know, you get the Providence, um, and some of the ones that are way OCD and how they yeah, do Yeah, Providence is ridiculous. It, it's over the top. And they literally say, it does not matter what their normal legal signature is. They have to sign the document this way. And the reality is, guys, the lender and the closing agent are the ones that are we're, we're working for. So if this borrower wants the loan to close, they have to follow the instructions the way that the lender says. So uh, we do not want to be a bottleneck and jam things up for everybody in the process just because we don't want to, you know, push the lender or the borrower to, to sign a certain way that's uncomfortable for them. That's the way the lender is requiring it, and that's the way we're going to have to do it. Now, I have done the same thing Carol said when it, I have evidence. I got an ID that shows this. The signing happened at 8 o'clock at night. Nobody was open to verify the signature, so I let them sign like this. And then they'll come back and say, no, we need them to sign the legal way. I will, or the other way, I'll go to bat on this. And it sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't. Sometimes they have to re-sign. If you really want to be safe, you just have them sign exactly as the name's typed. All right, let's go. Whoops. We're going to talk a little bit about printing now. I know printing is a major concern. And for those of you who are relatively new to the industry, um, printing, you, you are responsible for printing the documents in most cases, especially when you're working with signing companies. They're either going to upload the documents to a secure portal or they're going to email them securely to you or they might have some other software where you can download the uh, documents and print at home. And there's, there's a couple of different options for printing. And Carol, I know that you had mentioned uh, we, you know, you typically you want a dual tray printer. You want it to be a laser printer, relatively fast. You know, some of these loan document packages are 150 to 200 pages, but that's kind of, and you have to be able to print on both legal and leather sizes. Now, Carol, you had mentioned, and I hear, see, I see it in the forums a lot, that there's new software out there where that's not necessarily required anymore, right? Yeah, in the days when I first started, uh, I think that I paid seven or eight hundred dollars for our first dual tray printer as a Rico, and we got it at Costco. And then after that, it was an HP, which was six hundred and fifty dollars for a dual tray monochrome laser printer. But just recently, my husband bought one. It's an HP. It's not a dual tray. It has a single tray, but it does print on legal and letter. It was two hundred and nineteen dollars. And it's a great printer, metal parts, which you want to watch for. So what we have uh, on my graduates, I have a graduate's website. Now on the graduate's website, we offer, uh, they, they give us a little discount for page separator. And this is a great program. It's so easy. It's a software program. And that, in t that enables people to not have to go out and spend five, six, seven hundred dollars on a, a real workhorse of a laser printer. They can get this type of a printer, and then the page separator, when you get documents, you um, import those documents into this system, this page separator, and then it will, it will either merge if you've got a lot of attachments, or separate single if it's just a single attachment, but it will merge and separate or separate into two folders. When, after it finishes separating, you've got a folder that is for letter size paper, one that's for legal size paper. When you go to print, you just make sure that you tell your printer you're printing on letter paper, 
make sure that that one tray is filled with letter paper and it prints out all of those documents. You just put in legal paper and instruct your printer to print on legal size paper and, and everything prints beautifully, just as if you had that dual tray. Um, when you're buying a printer, the one thing I, I really want you to know is you've got to know whether you're getting metal parts or plastic parts because I have a lot of students who go out and they'll spend three, four hundred dollars on a dual tray laser printer and then they're calling me six months later and saying that printer I loved so much is now broken and it cannot be repaired because it has plastic parts. Yeah, you run into that a lot, especially at that price point. Um, the next is uh, document return. So also as a notary, oh, you know what, let me talk a little bit. Uh, this is kind of step four stuff too, but as far as documents go, when you're working escrow direct, uh, there is opportunity uh, for those who don't mind driving and hustling to uh, avoid some of your printing expense. So one of the things that I do is I very rarely have to print anymore because I pick up my documents from my client's office. And I pretty much am 100% escrow direct now. Every now and then I'll do a signing company, but it's usually just escrow direct. I like to go to the client's office. I like to be in front of their face. I like to interact. I like to continue that relationship. So it keeps building and building and building. So now I've got these awesome relationships because I'm in their office almost every single day. I'm picking up, I'm dropping off, whatever it might be. And I don't have to stress out and worry that, you know, other people are moving in on my clients or there's something wrong and something not being said. You know, I'm in their office. I can check in with them. I can get feedback. So if you have the, uh, a city that allows that and you don't mind the extra driving and the hustling, uh, I, that's always an option for you. A direct ESCO will give you the option to either pick up or they can send them to you electronically. So let's talk then about the document return. This is another big um, value add that I've done. So signing agents are responsible for returning the documents to the closing agent or to the signing company who's ever hired them. So a lot of times for signing companies, this is just going to be using the shipping label label they provided and dropping it off and getting a, a return receipt. That's a critical component of that. You wanna make sure you get the tracking number. So if anything goes wrong, you can prove that you've dropped those documents off. For escrow direct, it's a little bit different. Uh, you can, sometimes there is a FedEx label where they literally sh uh, ship it from across town, you know, you'll be on the west side of town, their office is on the east side, and they, they'll let you just ship it. I don't do that. One of the services I provide is expedited return, and that has really helped boost my new home purchase business because uh, those transactions are usually happening right away. So people will sign at eight o'clock in the morning and they're getting their keys, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon. So if the escrow officer knows they can get those documents back in a timely manner, I get more loan signings. They don't force the client to drive across town and sign the documents because they know they can rely on me to get those documents back. That's an excellent way to bring more value to your clients. Carol, do you have some more to say on shipping and document return? Oh, a lot to say. I'll try to keep it brief. Yeah. Returning your documents is, is extremely important. There's a few things you need to know. First of all, when you take courses, you'll learn. You've got to double check, triple check your documents. One of the things that I have always done is to check them at the table, double check them when I get home before I put them into the envelope, make sure that they're okay. You want to do certain things when you're shipping. You want to be sure and put the name of the borrower on the envelope itself in big black mark or whatever you have to do because if you have multiple signings, you don't want to do what I did one time which is to scramble them all up and send them to wrong title companies. Uh, luckily they worked together and they were willing to exchange when they got them. You want to make sure that your packages are secure. One of the things that you can do is to always have supplies on hand. You can do this by setting up accounts with FedEx or UPS and, and you'll learn as you go what kind of uh, supplies you need but they will deliver those for free to you. So UPS stores are very, very stingy about what they'll give you. Bill will probably tell you this. They don't want to give you anything but maybe one envelope. Uh, so you want to have the supplies on hand. You want to have them marked with who they go to, the name of the party. 
when you put them in the envelopes, I think it's a very good idea, and I demonstrate this on a video that we have on YouTube. Um, I like to take duct tape, not even shipping tape, duct tape, and wrap it around half of it so that there's no possibility that those documents, that envelope's going to get torn and the documents fall out. Uh, you always have to read your instructions. Some of the companies now are requiring that you use the polyethylene envelopes, the big plastic ones. Um, you always, always want to drop those off at the store itself. Never, never use those drop boxes because you're not getting a receipt. And I can't tell you how many times the uh, documents do not arrive at the destination and they will blame you because you are responsible for those documents until they're actually delivered to uh, escrow or the lender. So always take them to a store, always get receipt. If the worst happens and you have to take them to a drop box, take a photograph of you putting it in the box along with the photograph of the, the, the uh, pickup time uh, so that you at least can show that you didn't just throw that in an envelope or you know, in the box and walk away. Um, I think that's I think that's about all that's really important for you to remember. But uh, it, it is important that you take them to a store and get them either picked up at your home or to uh, get a receipt for them. Yeah, that <clears throat> that's definitely critical. And guys, we're also part of the resources we send out is uh, this and even more information about how important that is that will go out in the email a little later on today. Now we're going to move into phase four uh, or step four. Uh, this is the business and personal development side of things. So what this really, what it comes down to is this is uh, getting business. This is how to generate um, more clients, build relationships and create the income stream that you want to. One of the beautiful things that I kind of talk about in the very beginning is that this business can be pretty much anything that you want. And I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody again. Get some background noise. One of the beautiful things about this business is it can be anything that you need it to be. So if you just need a couple hundred bucks a month, you can very easily do that. In fact, in this business, it's relatively easy to make a couple grand a month extra. If you just want to do this as a part-time gig, if you want to really get out there and hustle and build a business with this, it is truly unlimited. And I do have a video on YouTube where I talk about, and I just break down the loan signing side, how many signings it would take to breach that $100,000 a year level. And it's, it's easier than you might think. And that's where the power of reverse engineering comes in. You know, you have this big goal that's overwhelming, but you just work yourself backwards until you get to the everyday actions that will make a difference in this. And that's where step four really comes into play. And I share my story a lot. Some of you may not know what the story is, but I didn't respect my notary business when I first started it. I treated it like an ATM machine. You know, I had other businesses going on, so uh, they had my attention. I just needed money. They weren't making money to pay me. So I had to go out, hustle, make a, if I needed $5,000, I went out and made $5,000 that month. If I only needed $500, I went out and made $500 that month. And then I went and I worked on my other businesses. It was not until I put all this energy and what we're going to talk about right now into this business that everything changed. You know, I went from making an average of thousand dollars a month to making $20,000 a month in the first 90 days of applying this stuff. And it's been gradually going up since then. This is a real business and you can really make a lot of money doing this and enjoy yourself along the way. So let's talk a little about it a little bit. You basically have a choice to make whenever you first come into the business. There's three ways that you can do this business. You can be, I don't know, can you see this? Am I too far over? An independent contractor for existing companies. So this is working for signing companies, just filling out an application. They're going to send you some business. They set your fees, so whatever they're willing to pay you, that's what you're going to work for unless you renegotiate a little bit. <clears throat> you can have fees that range hopefully in the 90 to $100 range on that one. But as we heard about and you can see, there are companies that offer a lot less than that. We'll talk about that another time though. The other option that you have is to work as per direct. And I'm going to mute everybody again.
This is where you go out. He keeps on muting themselves and I have background noise. So there we go. So when you work escrow direct, this is where you go out and you get the business yourself. You're building relationships with escrow companies, maybe real estate agents, loan officers. Uh, in the general notary work, you might be working with building hospital administration, senior living facilities, tow truck companies, you know, whatever it is, you're, you're building the relationships yourself. And then the third option that you have is a, actually a hybrid of these two. And this is what I recommend, especially when you're get, first getting started. So you can start as an independent contractor and kind of sharpen your teeth on signing companies. And as you get a little bit of experience, you gradually start building relationships here in the escrow direct side. On the escrow direct side, you know, you cut out the middleman. So your signing fees will go up somewhere between $150 and $300, depending on the part of the country that you're in. And on the hybrid side, you just start with the signings and then you kind of evolve your business uh, into the escrow officer side. So always keep in mind too, whatever this is, it's kind of wrapped up in your general notary work bubble. So no matter what you do, as far as the loan signing side goes, you always have the option to expand your general notary work business. And as we talked about in the very beginning of this call, there is a huge push to increase notary fees. So you can make a substantial living just doing general notary work. You know, if it's even 50 bucks a day on general notary work, that could just be one document sometimes. So that can make, that can adds up, you know, that's your $1,500 a month. So imagine if you're doing three or four, or sometimes in California, these last will and testaments and medical directives are three or $400 per visit. So those add up very, very quickly. So there's lots of opportunity here in how you do this. In addition to these streams of, of income, there's all kinds of little add-on businesses and services that you can throw on here. People get really creative with this. We won't get into that too much today, but just know that when you have flexibility and unlimited income potential, that makes a lot of options available to you. So you can add on, you know, we have uh, people who want to do fingerprinting or um, they have niches within the general notary work, like last wills and testament and stuff like that. So you've got options within that. Now, how to find your customers, though, that's really what this comes down to, right? And I know um, both Carol and I have uh, great resources for you. So I want to talk about basically what we're doing. <clears throat> what, what options you have available to you. So whether you're doing this general notary work or going the loan signing side where you're working at escrow direct or doing the hybrid model, you've got two ways to go about it in connecting with people. It's all about relationships. And whether you realize it or not, you have a database of potential contacts or contacts that are potential business partners or clients of yours. <clears throat> Every single person that you know is a potential uh, client or a referral to another client. So one of the first things that you want to do and that I advocate tremendously is write a list of every single person you know. Don't edit that list. Just write down everybody. That is your database. So you're going to have your warm leads that are on your database side. And then you're going to have your cold. Now the cold are the people that you don't know yet, but they're the people that you want to know. So it might be escrow companies, it might be uh, builders, it might be lenders, and, and those. <clears throat> a lot of people, especially just starting out because of the business culture that we have, we, they, they want to start right here. They want to send emails to escrow officers they don't know. They want to reach out to lenders that they don't know. They just want to sign up with signing companies that they don't know. 
because that's there's almost a, a safety to that. There's no risk. They don't know each other, so if they say no or if they don't answer, it's no big deal. Where the magic is going to happen for you in your business is on this side, though. When you have your database and you work to what I call tickle your database, and all that means is that you stay connected with people. You, know, you just be a functioning human being. You're not pitching your business. You're just staying connected. You're showing that you care about them. We're not just blasting Facebook with our business. We're not just throwing up on people about our business and what we do. We're actually showing genuine care for people. Most people do this anyway, especially in their tight circle. But if you expand that circle a little bit and you just stay connected with people, this is going to get so much easier. Because what you're going to do is find deeper ways than after you tickle, and then you're gonna go deeper connections. <clears throat> and this is where you find deeper or unique and creative ways to reach out for people. And when the time is right, after you've established some deeper relationships, or maybe you already have some now, uh, we'll do a, a complete training on the actual database and how to break that down at another time because it's very involved and there's very levels that you'll connect with. But once you do that, to ask somebody over here, whether it's a real estate agent, a lender, or an escrow officer, if you're lucky enough to have one of those in your circle, once you have that relationship, you can ask them, who's your favorite escrow officer and would you be willing to introduce me to them? I can't even ask this question anymore because every time I do, I get three or four referrals. And that's too much for me right now. I'm kind of tapped out. So this has worked for me. Every time I needed uh, clients, I sat down and I looked at my database and I went right through it. I started a campaign. Sometimes you can do it in a couple days, depending on how good you are at staying connected with people. Sometimes it takes a couple weeks or even a couple months to continually harvest your database. And this isn't about just seeing everybody as a, a sales target for you. This is about creating authentic and deeper relationships all the way around. It's going to help your business, of course. It's also going to help your life, of course, as you go through it. So <clears throat> still, a lot of people are uncomfortable with the warm side of it. It's too risky. They're afraid they're gonna make a mistake. They're afraid they're going to look foolish. They don't believe that they know the right people. All of that, of course, is a fallacy, but in the very beginning, I totally get it and I understand it. You can work up to this. If you want to go cold, there are the databases that Carol and I have already talked about. We have the Notary Rotary. Each of us in our course have lists of signing companies and title companies that you can connect with. A Google search can also get you those, but of course, like Carol said, be careful of the ones you sign up with. <clears throat> but still, that's only gonna serve you so, so much. You've got to connect deeply with escrow officers. And you've got to realize that there's a human being behind the title escrow officer or closing agent or closing attorney, whatever it might be for you. So <clears throat> to find them, first of all, is the hard part. There's actually a browser add-on called hunter.io. And hunter.io, when you load it onto your Chrome browser, will actually allow you, like if you know fidelity.com, and you just type that into the Hunter browser, it will bring up, it'll go out and like scrape websites, and it will bring up everybody's email address that has fidelity.com in it in, certain, in your particular area. So you can do that with builders, you can do that with loan officers, you can do that with any company name that you have. You can pull that up and it's gonna give you a list of email addresses. <clears throat> and that's gonna allow you to start a cold email campaign or a phone call campaign to these escrow officers. Now, the training on how to connect with those escrow officers can be probably another two hour training. What I'm just gonna throw out there for you though is this is not about throwing up about your business. This is about bringing value to the potential client and talking about them. Make it about them and you can get your foot in the door a lot more than just talking about you. They get inundated with emails, like 300 emails a day. Some of it's people pitching stuff to them. Most of it is stuff working with their files. 
you're not going to get through just looking like everybody else. You have to find a unique and creative way to get you from the door. If that's a coupon or a Starbucks gift card or an article that you found about them and that you're acknowledging them on, when you make it about them, there's a lot more power in that. And so what you're doing here, you can go cold and still be effective. But do your research. Don't just send out a thousand emails and hope you get one. You could send out five emails that, you, that are well-researched. You find them on LinkedIn. You see that they just won the Top Performer Award or they just went to Costa Rica for their company's uh, top salesperson event. You can, uh, you can do a little bit of research and really customize an email and make, make an impression on them and get your foot in the door, get a meeting, get a phone call, whatever it is to start building that relationship. And then, I know we're kind of running over on time, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. I just want to talk real quick about the general notary work side because this is so important. Guys, if you're going to go on the general notary work side, people have got to find you. The general public does not necessarily always know that there are directories of notaries public. <clears throat> so where do people go when they need something? They go to Google. So it is absolutely imperative that you have a digital presence, like a website. And it also is imperative that you SEO it. That means search engine optimization. There are strategies that you can do yourself. You can build your own website, you can do it yourself, or you can hire somebody to do it. In my experience, it's one of the most expensive investments I've ever made in my companies, but there are plenty of tutorials and books that will teach you how to do it, just a basic setup. And when you use Google Your Business, it actually, helps businesses get found on Google. And there's already, I know in our particular course, there's already tons of students getting lots of general notary work just from that feature. Their uh, clients are gonna go to their phone, they're gonna look for a notary near them, and hopefully you'll be at the top of that list and you'll get that call. <clears throat> the other part of that, guys, is none of this matters if you don't answer your phone. As an owner of a signing company who goes down the list at Notary Rotary, and signingagent.com, it blows my mind how many phones, how many numbers I have to call before somebody actually picks up the phone and is looking for business. So all the marketing in the world won't do any good if you guys don't answer your business lines. Carol, I kind of dominated that entire conversation. What do you have to say? No, I was going to say one of the things that people get a big kick out of on that video that I do, which is from uh, the call, phone call that I get to the getting my check at the end of the month is the fact that uh, when I was a signing agent, my phone never rang that I didn't answer it. And there was plenty of times when I would be in the shower with shampoo in my hair <laughs> answering my phone. And I had that on the video. Well, of course not me in the shower, but <laughs> showing that that phone was always sitting on the towel bar. <laughs> and you're right. You have to do that because that call you miss, that could be the beginning of hundreds <laughs> of signings that you might get from, from the company. So yeah, that's very important. Carol, uh, uh, are we going to kind of wind this down now? And did yeah. you want to answer questions or? We sure are. Um, real we quick. can cover this at another time. I think we're going to do. Uh, yep. So what we're going to do. Um, we're going to be doing this again. Yeah, we'll, we'll be doing quite a few of these. So the, um, the next step is just the tools and the resources that you can use for to help uh, invoicing and things like that. And since we ran out of time, uh, Carol has highly suggested Notary Assist, which is kind of an all-in-one uh, invoicing and tr mileage tracker and all that good stuff. A great tool specifically. Well, it is everything as a signing agent. Perfect. Yeah, so, it, it does everything. It keeps track of your client. Your con oh, I'm sorry, we're stepping on each other. Oh, that's okay. I think. Did you want me to talk about it? No, I was just going to just uh, refer them to that so they can get some more details on that because we are pretty much out of time, guys. Yeah. I really appreciate your patience. However, I know there's some great questions in here. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to go kind of through the chat here uh, to clarify. Yeah, you never answer a phone in the signing, guys. Even though you want to answer the phone and get your business, you always, always, always respect the customer and you do not answer your phone while you're sitting in the middle of a signing. I'm hoping that's common sense for most people. Um, however, so it is your responsibility to run your business. You need redundancy. So there are options for you. You can call, you can set up um, uh, 
forwarding to another person that can help you, a spouse, uh, an assistant, you have virtual assistants, you have voicemail that can be, that you can put them on hold until you're available or they can leave a voicemail. There's lots of ways that you can manage that and still be effective without being rude. <clears throat> hey, um, Bill. Yeah. We disagree about something. Oh, do we? What do you? First time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's your When take? I was a new signing agent, I always answered my phone. But what I would do is I would uh, let my customer know that I would show them my phone and I would say, this is my lifeline to my, my income. And I would let them know that if with their permission, I get a phone call and I see that it is somebody ready to hire me, that I would stay on the phone no more than 20 seconds. And I never had anyone tell me, no, I don't want you to answer the phone. They all said, oh, yeah, well, if it comes to your income and your business, then please do it. Uh, I never actually had to do it, but I always let them know and ask them permission it, if they wouldn't mind if I get a phone, a phone call. Well, there you go. That's a difference. I mean, after a few years, you know, people leave messages. Yeah. But at the beginning, they don't. And everybody needs to understand. They need to answer that phone no matter where they are. So we disagree. This is, yeah, this is one of those areas, guys, where you have to trust the integrity inside you. If you're okay with something like that, then you do it. And if you're not, then you don't. It's your business. <clears throat> and then also, um, you've got to uh, also uh, do go with what the company, who's ever paying you, you have to follow their rules <clears throat> too. So if you're sitting in a title office, yeah, um, you probably don't want to do that. There's going to be exceptions. But again, this is all about you. It's your business. You've got to run it. Uh, so you got to trust what feels right to you. Okay, let's go through a few more of these. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. Power of attorneys. Yep. There's lots of questions about the general notary work. Yes, guys, we will record this. We had to use a different format, but this is recording. I verified that like 50 times through here. So we've got it recording. Uh, and I'll get it posted to my YouTube page and we'll get it over to Carol so she can post it on her profiles as well. <clears throat> Let's see if we've got any new questions that are just popping up here too. Patrick, you're, to answer your question about the uh, single tray printer, it's a program called Page Separator. I believe it's a paid app that you can use that will separate the legal size and the leather size. <clears throat> and guys, we're going on about an hour and 20 minutes. So here's what I'm going to do. If you have questions that we have not answered yet, please retype them So, because I'm going trying to go through them. And I, I'm getting lost in the conversation here. Uh, da, 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 da. Lots of companies send out surveys later asking about you, Yvette. Yep, that's a good point. So that's why another incentive to be a professional at all times. It does not look like there's any other questions coming in right now. <clears throat> what are the- Oh, I do want to address one. Yeah. Uh, Bill, there's a question here. It says Notary Rotary has one for free. Uh, and it, it fails people more times than not. Okay. The page and I spoke to the owner of uh, Page Separator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and she explained to me, it's too technical, but she explained to me why it, it breaks down and it doesn't work at the time. I'm just letting people know. Perfect. Yana asks, what are the bare basic materials that you would suggest when one is just getting started and you have a limited budget? Uh, you want me to answer that? Yeah. We'd love it. Am I, are, can you hear me? I can, yes. Go ahead. I'd love for you to answer that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I deal with that a lot because a lot of the people that come to me uh, are really uh, hurting. They don't have a lot of money. So uh, basically it's been uh, the most expensive thing you're going to spend money on is the printer. 
That's why I talk about that HP printer that my husband just got. It's a great little printer, does everything that's required of it, as long as you can add page separator, which is, um, uh, well, my students get a discount, but it's about 60 bucks. And um, of course you need uh, clips for your, to hold your documents together. Some people use rubber bands. I don't like that. You can, they can easily slip out of the rubber bands. We have a whole list of the things that you need to do, but you can you can do it very inexpensively. Uh, your shipping supplies are all provided by the shippers themselves. You need pens. You can use, uh, I would suggest some good, they don't have to be expensive, but some decent pens and make sure that you get them back from everybody as you hand them out. Um, just basic, just basic supplies. Um, they don't have to run you a lot of money and you can always add to stuff as you go. Yeah, exactly. So whenever I'm in a big hurry, <laughs> yeah, just so you guys know, like the printer is the biggest expense you have, but when I'm doing efficient signings, I don't have a whole lot of stuff with me. I have a journal, my pens, uh, most of my documents have clips already and then my stamp and that's it. I can perform my entire business with those few things on there. The rest is helpful, especially when you need it, but you don't need an entire arsenal to get going on this thing. You can literally start uh, with, by the bootstraps. Okay, guys, I'm going to wrap it up right now because this has been long and we had those technical issues. I really appreciate all of you who hung in there with us. Uh, and participated and asked so many great questions. Now, both Carol and I are totally available to you. If you have follow-up questions, uh, just send me an email to orders at notarycoach.com, and then Carol is carol at notary2pro.com, and we would be more than happy to answer your questions. Now, I've actually got a signing that is uh, on the other side of the town, so it might take me some time. Uh, number one, to upload this video, and number two, uh, to answer your questions, but I will definitely get to that today, and I really appreciate your time. Carol, thank you so much for reaching out and making this possible. I'm very excited to share our passion of this business uh, with so many people. And I am too, and I thank you for kind of taking technological control of this thing, although we did have a hiccup today, <laughs> didn't we? And yeah. I want to thank everybody for, for coming. I recognize a few of you, uh, those that are brave enough to be on, or if you didn't know, you're on camera. <laughs> I see some students. Um, so everybody have a great weekend, and we're going to be doing this again, and hope you guys enjoyed this and got something out of it. All right. Thank you so much, guys. There's follow-up emails coming up later on today as well with all the resources and then some that we talked about and that we didn't get to. So I hope you enjoy those. And again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Have a great day.